Hi everyone, thanks so much Stefan and it's just been so exciting for us to work with Stefan and get ready for this class. Um, and, I mean, I know he's like seems overly enthusiastic and saying it's going to be a really good show, but we really have some great speakers and we're excited to bring them here. And a lot of people are traveling a distance to come when they're when they're here, so I really appreciate uh, Stefan's comments about just like really make an effort to be here and be here on time because um, there are going to be some people worth listening to. But my job right now is essentially just to give a little sneak preview of why we think the Sailor Sea is so important and significant enough to actually create an institute and have this focus on it. So as was mentioned, um, the Sailor Sea is a name that's intended to acknowledge the whole ecosystem. So three bodies of water, the Strait of Georgia, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and Puget Sound make the Salish Sea. When you have one term for a whole water body, then you can start talking about it that way and acknowledge the fact that it actually is one connected ecosystem. Um, it's quite unusual to have such a rich ecosystem like this that's an international body of water. And um, in that, that governance piece is really interesting and it poses a lot of challenges and a lot of questions and things worth looking into um, over the quarter. That's one of the bits of pieces that we're going to explore a little bit. Um, the, the border is by no means an even line, um, and this, this line that it is, is also happens to be a line that an awful lot of vessel traffic travels. Um, we have a lot of shipping traffic, we have booming commerce here, and so vessels from um, Port of Vancouver, uh, from Port of Tacoma, Seattle, come up um, and cross these waters, and um, some of them carrying some fairly hazardous materials. This map also speaks really to the, the wealth of the area, the rich culture that we have. Um, and another way of looking at this without an international border cutting it, it, it sparks a different um, interest for the region. And so when we talk about why the Salish Sea is so important, um, well, one of those facts for why it's so important is we have over 60 tribes and First Nations in the Salish Sea region. Um, that's significant. Tribes and First Nations, um, we have sovereign nations, we have treaties to respect, um, we have cultures to explore. And what I love about this map is also it kind of acknowledges the interrelationship. There's families, um, there's families that have gotten split up by the border and they can, getting back and forth between family and that travel makes it complicated. So we're going to hear some indigenous voices this quarter. Um, talking about a number of different topics. We, as I mentioned, we do have um, a lot of commerce. This is uh, the Tawasin waterfront, taken from the, the ferry shot. Um, a lot of different kind of commerce traveling through, but I wanted to put up this map because it's, here we are in the Pacific Northwest, in the corner of um, the country. And I know this might be hard to read some of the bits and pieces of the map, but generally what it's acknowledging is a couple things. One is that we have fossil fuels coming across our state from elsewhere, from outside, out of state. And the intention of many of the carriers is to get them out of here and over to Asia to sell them. And we're in the middle, and we're our state Department of Ecology in this particular map they made this map, and they're showing, I think it really shows the limits of their authority, but they, they're trying to regulate this stuff that's coming through by different means. Um, on the other side of the border, uh, there's, you may have heard something about a pipeline up there. Uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline, now owned by, um, by Canada. Uh, if that goes through, it will have really significant um, effect in, um, on vessel traffic. And again, through that red line is, is where that vessel traffic is going to go through, um, carrying a variety of, of, of fossil fuels. We're going to hear from one of our, we're going to try to intersperse uh, reminders about speakers coming in. So the captain of the U.S. Coast Guard in this region, Linda Sturgis, is one of our speakers and she's going to talk about vessel traffic, vessel traffic safety and avoiding spills and her work uh, working with her colleagues across the border. Patty Govin, too. Patty will talk about pipeline, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we have approximately 8 million people living in the Salish Sea, along with 
37 species, species of mammals, a lot of birds, fish, many, many more invertebrates. Many of these um, creatures, the populations are on fairly steep declines for a variety of reasons associated with, with human impacts. Um, Joe Gatos from the Sea Doc Society is going to be with us, our first, uh, our first outside speaker next week. Uh, one of the books from Sea Doc Society is this gorgeous one about the Salish Sea. And the bookstore is going to be here um, selling some of these after afterwards next week. So we're trying to take advantage of some, some of those opportunities with the speakers to do some additional things. So here's a map of whole wastewater treatment plants. I'm not going to go through all of the various impacts that we're having on the region. I just wanted to touch on a few um, that I had handy pictures of, for one thing. Uh, but one of the things that this shows is the difference between uh, kind of population on one side of the border versus another. We have a lot more people on the U.S. side. Um, we have a lot more sewage treatment plants and a lot more waste wastewater effluents. Um, we also have a lot of runoff coming from highways. There's a whole variety of impacts to the, to the marine waters. And we, um, we manage those differently. So in the U.S., you know, our system of regulations is different than Canada. Canada doesn't have a Clean Water Act. It doesn't have a Clean Air Act. Uh, it doesn't have an Endangered Species Act. Uh, they work things uh, a little differently. So as you think about some of those differences as we have speakers come in, um, and you might want to pose questions to better understand how resources are managed uh, on, on both sides of the border in a different sort of a way. So um, this is just a, like I said, I'm just sort of picking and choosing a few of the environmental impacts. And whereas sewage treatment plants, wastewater plants, very specific discharges, we're feeling the impacts of climate change in this region. And that's something that's much more global in scale. Um, this is showing uh, changes, expect, expected changes in, in water and air temps, looking out towards 2100. Um, huge amount of variation in that. This is from the Climate Impacts Group at University of Washington. Um, so those changing water temperatures are going to have a big effect on the marine waters. And other depressing impacts of climate change include sea level rise and storm surge um, and some things to keep an eye on. Now I'm bummed that we don't actually have a speaker specifically talking about climate change, but again, that's something to kind of bear in mind as you're listening to speakers talk about environmental issues or even about economic issues, you might pose some questions associated with, with climate. But we just couldn't, it's only one quarter, so we can only back in so much. Uh, the, the last bit about climate change that I'll talk about is just is ocean acidification, which is something that we're feeling, documenting here on Puget Sound. Shellfish were, were affected and have been affected by ocean acidification and their inability to reproduce and grow seed. Um, again, we're not going to dive into that issue, but it's it's interesting to note that we're on the forefront of that and have put a lot of energy into trying to figure out um, to do about it. Um, okay, so this is another kind of depressing shot. It's hard to talk about things. These are the, the smoke that we've had recently from wildfires. Um, and, and the intensity of wildfires seems to be, again, associated with, with climate change. And I did want to mention we have a, a speaker coming in, Ellen Kelsey. She's a writer from Victoria. And she's actually going to talk about hope and how to have hope for our, our waters and, you know, and acknowledging that there's kind of some depressing stories going on out there. So it won't be all grim, I promise. <laughs> so one of the stories that you're familiar uh, with hearing about now, uh, just the incredibly difficult um, tragedies of our southern resident killer whales. And you've probably heard a bit about the Washington Task Force um, that's proposed some recommendations. We have a couple speakers coming in. Um, Misty McDuffie with the Rain Coast, um, Rain Coast Con Conservation Alliance. Or something. <laughs> I haven't met Misty yet, but we talked on the phone. Um, so she's, she's done ORCA research. She'll talk a bit about their, their health from the, um, she's in British Columbia. And also Linda Mapes, who's a Seattle Times reporter, has really been following the, um, the stories of the ORCAs and has written quite a bit about it. And she'll be here in a couple, uh, she'll be here on Valentine's Day. So um, that will that'll be interesting as well. So it's important to recognize, in addition to um, 
a variety of businesses that we have in the area. We also have some businesses that require clean water um, to be to stay in business. Um, they rely on clean water and a healthy habitat. We did not get anybody from the economic sector, but Laurie's going to talk a little bit about trade here briefly as soon as we're done. So I wanted to throw in the, this beautiful photo from Clark Island. Um, you know, it's important for us to remember that it's this place, the beauty of this place is pretty spectacular. And um, sometimes we take it for granted, and sometimes we also have to remember that even though it looks so gorgeous, you can't really tell what's going on below the surface. So looks can be deceiving. I think that's the other, one of the other things that comes to mind in thinking about Linda Mapes and her job with the Seattle Times is she's conveying, um, she's helping the, the general public see these stories and she's translating complex environmental issues into material for the general public. It'll be interesting to hear her talk a little bit about that and, and how you do that, how you translate those messages. Because if people don't know there's problems under the surface, then there's not going to be interest in helping to solve them. So as much as we rely on clean habitat, it's not just us. But Bo, he wants the water clean because he doesn't want to get an ear infections. <laughs> Neither do we. Sorry, I just couldn't resist putting this picture in. And uh, maybe I'll bring Bo in. Maybe he could be our last speaker if somebody could, like on the cut list if somebody doesn't show. <laughs> so um, again, I'm just going to touch a little bit because I just have so little time. I'm just going to tell you uh, another little interesting fact about the environment of the Salish Sea. The, pulse of um, fresh water that you see on this graph is from the Fraser River, which is on the north side of the border. Um, so that's the biggest amount of fresh water input uh, that we get. And um, it's important to recognize that the Salish Sea is an estuary. It's a fairly dramatic picture that shows how those waters meet when you have the, the um, effluent from rivers that in this case happen to be pretty darn silty um, meeting the um, incoming tide. There's a big, big change in those waters. So um, we're excited to tell you more about the Salish Sea. We really hope that bringing stories of the Salish Sea from different perspectives, learning about the ecology of the area, um, helps inspire stewardship and helps inspire people to um, really feel a little bit more connected to where we are. And that's part of the reason why there is a Salish Sea Institute here, because here we are right in the heart of the Salish Sea. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lori from the Board Policy Research Institute. Well, I'm another institute director. Um, half a point. Half a point there. Um, so I'm Lori Trauma, I'm the director of the Border Policy Research Institute on campus. And we've been around since around 2005. We were created largely after 9-11 um, happened. There was a recognition that the flow of people and goods across the border between Canada and the United States was incredibly disrupted. And the state of Washington <clears throat> depends pretty heavily on our trade with with Canada, and also we have a lot of families that move back and forth. So we do applied research on the border, primarily focusing on the area between Washington and British Columbia. Um, we do research on security, transportation, trade. We used to do some environmental research, but now that the Salish Sea Institute is here, we're sort of stepping away from that topic. So I only have five minutes, so I'm gonna speak very briefly. I wanted to make just a few points. One is that our region on this map is the Cascade Gateway, and we're very different from other areas of the Canada-US border. Is anybody in here Canadian or from anywhere along the border? So our region looks different from the Buffalo-Niagara region or the Detroit-Windsor region. There's different people that move back and forth. There's different goods that move back and forth. And our region is actually the busiest for the number of people going back and forth. And we have less moving back and forth in trade. But because our policies are created at the federal scale, we treat the border as kind of this homogenous place, and it's a one-size-fits-all policy. But those policies have very different impacts in different locations. And that's something that we study a lot of. My second point is that our border region is very unique. We have a lot of research and a lot of focus, both by private sector, by governments, and by institutions, focusing on the cross-border relationship. And that's not common in other areas of the US-Canada border. One example of this is the Cascadia Innovation Corridor, which is an effort that got started, it started decades ago, but its latest iteration started around 2016, 
to really tie together the innovation sectors and the tech hubs in Vancouver and Seattle and to a lesser extent Portland to say that if we work together and we leverage each other's strengths, we can build a global tech hub. And not just tech, but the life sciences as well. There's some really innovative cancer research that's done in British Columbia and in Washington. And so how do we work together to really elevate that? And another part of that as well is how do we make this place a livable place? Um, natural environment is certainly part of that, but also looking at transportation. We have huge congestion problems, affordable housing. So looking at really improving the quality of life from a regional perspective, not just from a US perspective or a Canadian perspective. And the final point I wanted to make, I'm going to counterbalance Ginny's um, sort of sad stories and try to end on an optimistic <laughs> note and say that despite all of the unpleasant and tension-filled politics that we have between the US and Canada right now, things that have not been going so well for our two countries, we have an incredible relationship of peace and um, friendship, really, between our countries. And this is apparent in a kind of symbolic way right at our border crossing in Blaine, the Peace Arch Crossing. Has anybody been up to the Peace Arch Park itself and actually hung out there? A lot of people have. So it's a really unique space because you can visit that park regardless of your citizenship, regardless of if you have uh, crossing documents like a passport, and a lot of families go there and share that space. And when you think about that sort of unity compared to what's happening on the U.S.-Mexican border, it really highlights how important it is to continue to talk to our neighbors across the border, to continue to, to work together and look at our region as an integrated place for improving our economy, improving our um, economic relationships, and our environmental relationships. So I'm going to stop there, short and sweet, and pass it on to whoever's next. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I think we want to um, do we? It's just re for recording, right? Correct. Okay. <laughs> just making sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Natalie Beloy, and I'm the associate director of Transboundary and Place-Based Initiatives at Western, and that includes the Salish Sea Institute, the Border Policy Research Institute, and the Center for Canadian American Studies. Um, and I'm Lydia Dnaley. I'm a fifth-year student here at Western Washington University, and at Fairhaven College specifically. Um, and I have worked with the Salish Sea Institute for the past two years to help create the Salish Sea Minor um, along with other programs that we're developing within the Salish Sea Institute. So we're going to talk a little bit about what's happening here on campus in regards to cross-border programs and learning. Um, a lot of what Lori and Ginny were talking about is this broader scale work and a lot of their work is very public facing and outward facing. They work with a lot of partners beyond the campus. Um, and Lydia and I have been working with them, with faculty at Western and with students at Western as well as community partners in the region to start to put together a, a curriculum about the Salish Sea here at Western. There are already a lot of classes that are taught about the region, um, but they're not kind of together in a package so that's what we're trying to do and then also to augment what's already offered with some more classes that really get into the uh, cross-border issues the environmental issues the cultural issues that uh, really span the border do you want to talk about its formation yes so I think fall of last year, winter of last year, me and another um, first year student, Diego, who was unable to be here, and Natalie were, came together to try to figure out what made up the Salish Sea and what we wanted to look like, what fields we wanted to look for classes in within pre-existing classes at Western. Um, and from studying abroad in another um, colonized country, we came up with this model looking at the environmental, social, and economic, and kind of seeing how those all interact with each other for this, trying to com uh, comprise the Salish Sea Studies minor. So at first, that included Coast Salish Histories and Sovereignty, Ecological Health and Restoration, and Canada-US, specifically BC-Washington relationships. And in the past year, with help from students, like in our class, Sally 497, which was a one-credit class held this year that's also being held um, this quarter, um, we were able to work with students and faculty and also members of the community to kind of change and evolve the minor into what it is now. Yeah, um, and so this is sort of what the minor is going to look like, hopefully. Um, we're still in formation of this. The goal is that it launches next fall. Um, the goal is also that it will evolve over time because we have really great existing expertise and we have some gaps on the campus um, in some areas that we hope to enhance and advance further um, in upcoming years. So 
There will be a couple of core classes. Sally 201 is the introduction to the Salish Sea class, and I'm really excited to be working with Dr. Marco Hatch from Environmental Science down in the front row and Lydia um, in the spring to offer an experimental version of that class um, that will have some experiential learning opportunities, um, getting off campus together, uh, and we'll really try to encompass all these different learning domains. Um, we also have Sally 490, which is what Sally 497 will become, and that's an upper level Salish Sea Studies Community Seminar. It's a one credit class that we hope students will take and repeat over time to build community among students who are really passionate, uh, passionate about place-based learning. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are four learning domains, the three that um, were in that first Venn diagram that Lydia showed, ecological health and restoration, Canada-US, BC-Washington relationships, those remain, as well as Salish Sea histories and cultures, which is sort of a broader scope than Coast Salish sovereignty um, and history, which was in the previous one and still will be in there. But we have a lot of work to do to build up our ability to teach thoughtfully in that domain on this campus. So we're expanding that for now to focus on what we do have some uh, expertise in and we'll be building that over time. And then lastly, uh, we got some suggestions to incorporate more of the humanities into this minor. So we added storytelling, art, and science communi communication. So we have journalism classes, communications classes, art classes that will be part of the minor as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so this quarter, the Sally 497 is paired with the Oxley Speaker Series. How many of you are in 497 yeah. this quarter? Great. Sweet. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and so we're going to be working with students, and again, kind of as we mentioned, we're going to work over the next couple years to kind of fill the gaps that we have um, currently um, and to be able to work with the community to really create a as much as you can with the minor, a cohesive kind of look and critical view of the Salish Sea and of the relationship between those two countries. Um, also, if you are not in Sally 497 or you want more information, um, in addition to working at the Salish Sea Institute, I'm also part of Students for the Salish Sea, which is an on-campus group. How many people have heard or are in Students for the Salish Sea? Awesome. Sweet. Well, our meeting is also at 5.30 right after this, up in room 406 at 5.30. Um, it's an hour and a half meeting, so if you are not able to be in 497 or want to be more involved or if you want to talk to me about anything further too, you can find me up there after that and pretty much every Thursday after the Huxley Speaker Series. This quarter we'll be meeting for an hour and a half to discuss what we can do as students until this minor is launched and kind of create connections between the institute and student bodies on campus in addition to other colleges in the vicinity like Northwest Indian College and Whatcom Community College. That's right. Thanks. Oh yeah, thanks for mentioning Whatcom too because yeah. I wanted to also say that our experimental class in the spring will be linked with Whatcom Community College mm -hmm. and with support from Northwest Indian College as well to help inform the course design. So we'll be having some shared learning experiences between a class that will also be called, er, held there called Introduction to the Sailor Sea. So we're trying to create a direct transfer equivalency mm -hmm. between the institutions. So if any of you are Whatcom transfer students, um, the goal is that uh, the students coming after you will be able to take that class there and transfer it here and have credit mm -hmm. um, and that we can also have some shared learning across the different colleges in our region because we have a pretty special higher education ecosystem here in Bellingham with a technical college, tribal college, community college, and our liberal arts college here at Western. So I'm excited about all of these collaborations and we'd be happy to answer questions. We have a few minutes for Q&A. Can you put up the speakers? Oh yeah, thanks. Out a couple of talks, make uh, the correlations. So I talked about Joe. I mentioned Ellen, Christian Wilhelmsen, and um, Mindy Roberts are two conservation leaders from one from Washington, one from British Columbia. So they're going to talk about kind of differences in conservation strategies uh, across the border. Uh, I can do this. Yeah. Um, That's recording. I mentioned Linda Sturgis, I mentioned Linda Mapes and Misty. Valerie Seagrest is going to talk about food sovereignty issues. Um, that's going to be really interesting. Patty Gobin specifically um, going to focus on treaty rights and the Trans Mountain Pipeline. So interesting case because treaty rights from a Tulalip tribal perspective on an issue that's across the border. Um, and then Ray Harris is going to be our final speaker. He's awesome. He's with the Chimanis First Nation. He's on um, my advisory board for the Sailor Sea Institute. Um, he's going to be doing like dual duty with the Sailor Sea Speaker Series um, and that. And I don't know what he's going to talk about, but whatever it is, it's going to be great because he's really fun. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 
So we have 10 minutes um, and we'll bring Lori and Ginny up here and we'll come and join you. Um, and we can answer questions that you have about what we just shared, about the minor, about the series, um, about the institutes and what we do. How do we want to do? Yeah. Uh, what are some of the problems you're spearheading with uh, dealing with Canada that doesn't have all these uh, same regulations that we do? How are you dealing with trying? Are you trying to get them to create regulation, or what are your what's your approach with that? So that's a great question. Could everybody hear his question? Just I think he's wondering what the institute itself is doing with relationship to the different um, strategies of protection strategies across the border. So. With one caveat that the CLHC Institute is still young and um, getting our legs under us, uh, but I am right now trying to put a forum together um, between um, some leaders in British Columbia and Washington to compare strategies on what's happening with orca recovery. And as I was talking to um, folks across the border, and I said specifically, what, are you, what would make this meeting of interest to you? And they said, for one thing, understanding how we manage differently like how does your system work? So they're under a directive to try to um, meet our Washington management strategies for orcas and they need to better understand who's their corollary across the border. So we're bringing those, um, I think this is gonna work that we're gonna have a meeting in March but it's all kind of in flux right now. Yeah and I would add too um, that one thing to note is Canada does have policies about all these things, but they're, like Jenny mentioned, at these different levels um, in different kinds of jurisdictions or domains. So oceans, for example, or saltwater is often managed at the federal level. We have a Washington Department of Ecology and other state level things here in Washington. So uh, a student that we worked with in Canada House and in the Salish Sea Institute last quarter, Chris Panuelas, uh, he helped to put together a couple of diagrams that help show what are the different policies, um, governing bodies, agencies, agencies on both sides of the border in regards to particular issues, um, salmon recovery, orca recovery, et cetera, and what are the different relationships between those state level, federal level entities and tribes and first nations on each side of the border because there's um, duties to consult and other kinds of relationships there. So he tried to convey in a page, you know, a page document, which is more complex than it sounds, um, these different political jurisdictions and, and policies. And I don't want to make it just sound like we're doing everything better than British Columbia, because yeah. we're not. You know, there's things, that, I mean, particularly around the, the whales, like one example, their ferry system is way quieter than ours, and they've implemented some different sorts of strategies and some fishing closures. So there's, there's just these different protection strategies, and hopefully we can harmonize them and raise the bar on what we're all doing with regards to that one particular issue, but there's, there's going to be a whole number of issues hopefully we can begin to, to help on. Do you want to add anything? No. Okay. Yes. Yeah? I heard the phrase um, place-based learning. I was wondering if you could explain what that means. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to start first? No? Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a good question and actually we had a curriculum feedback session last month and several students from the Masters of, of Environmental Education program came to that and um, and asked about that same question but they also brought up critiques of place-based learning and what about land-based education or land-based pedagogies um, which are uh, debates around how we frame these things and our connections to place. And so I would say that's an evolving question in terms of the Salish Sea Studies minor, but what it means to me is to have uh, an opportunity for students to understand the complexities of this region, of the place that they're in, and to be here and think about here and the histories of this place, the responsibilities we carry living in this place, um, and to have an understanding of, uh, of the, like Lydia said, social, cultural, ecological, economic dimensions of a region. So not just the natural world, but also the, the socio-political world and what's shaping it. Um, and to really give students an ethic of being where they are, and they can take that elsewhere, that ethic with them, um, but giving them the tools and the habits and practice to have a mode of inquiry about this place that they're in. 
So I might add to that one important fact that we neglected to mention as part of our overview is that right now we're on traditional Lummi territory. That's a really huge part of learning about your place, learning about what was, who was here before, what's our relationship to that now, and, and through all that, really having a stronger connection. So um, it's, it's kind of a simple, you know, idea. It's really just about learning where we are. And while many people who come to Western are from the area, um, a lot of people have, are, are not from the area, but also it's like, have you ever really taken the time to think about it as a region and what are the connections? And the more we know, the more, you know, knowledge is power, right? And then one quick thing to add to, I think, yeah, echoing what Jenny, Jenny and Natalie have said too, I think that a big part of place-based connections is also learning about the community. So in of most classes, if you aren't in like a Huxley class or like a geology class that has planned field trips, there is really no reason or no space created to get outside of the classroom and interact like with even just like, yes, the earth and the places, but also the people who make up this community outside of this institution. And even though this institution has so many amazing opportunities and we're able to do that, there's also a lot of really amazing, brilliant people here who aren't in this university setting. Um, and so that's one thing with the 201 or the introduction to the Salish Sea is really trying to like one of my main goals is to also get us out not only kind of interacting with the land and not in a classroom and sitting down, but also with other community members who especially post-grad, we can go back and keep those connections like some of the people in the newsroom who I've been able and very lucky to meet outside of that. So that's another goal of ours. Thanks. Do you still have seats in the Sally 497 class? Or is it full? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, Sally 497 registration has been fluctuating all week. So, there are 25 seats in the class. When I checked yesterday, there were no seats. Today, there's like 23 total. Um, so, two seats left. Um, I didn't check right before this, so maybe that's changed. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think there's a couple seats, maybe. Um, and just to take that prompt, um, in Sally 497 this quarter, um, we'll be really using our time together to, to reflect on the speakers, to do some readings related to each week's speakers, uh, to develop some kind of critical reflection about what they're sharing. Um, and so students can enroll in ESI 499 or just attend if you can't enroll um, and then come to class on Friday tomorrow at 1 um, where we'll be in Canada House and talk further about each speaker and draw some connections between them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as we mentioned, Sally 497 will become 490. It'll change a little bit each time, but this, this quarter we've decided to focus on the speaker series as a way to dig a little deeper. Mm -hmm. Will the 497 class be offered every quarter? That's the goal. Um, it'll look different, though. Um, so uh, in the fall, we did a couple of um, excursions together. We went tide pooling. We went up to Vancouver. Um, we read one book together over the quarter. We talked about the Salish Sea Studies curriculum. Um, in future iterations, we might do like a whole weekend, and that's your one credit is you know more of an intensive class, um, going camping together or something. So we're waiting to see how that unfolds. But the goal is that we can have uh, one credit of time together each quarter. Um, and have some new experiences together as a community. Um, and the goal too for people who are interested in pursuing the minor too is to make it repeatable but also make it kind of a space for, um, especially since the Salish Sea, anybody, any major can come and be a part of it and there's a lot of different classes offered. Hopefully that 497, which will become 490, will also be a good just kind of meeting place to form a community around people who are interested in the Salish Sea um, and making it repeatable. I think we've kind of just had a few discussions on how many times somebody can repeat the class, but it's going to be different pretty much every quarter, similar. Um, and I want to pay credit to Kate Darby, who's part mm -hmm. of Huxley. Um, and so I took her one credit. It was like the very first quarter that it was offered, um, planning for the environmental justice minor at Western. Um, and so I was a part of that process. And then once I got hired at the Salish Sea Institute, proposed it um, here for this creation of our minor. And it w worked really well. And last quarter, was anybody in Sally 490? Seven last quarter. <laughs> Faith, Over there. <laughs> yeah, like a few people who were able to offer us feedback and really again give yeah. students a voice on the majors or minors that they would be taking at Western, um, since that's sometimes lacking in a lot of other departments. And we'll be joining 
with Kate's class once or twice this quarter mm -hmm. as well, because it's meeting at the same time, unfortunately. Um, and so we'll join together and have some conversations about linked learning. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. OK. Great. <laughs> Look at that. Good timing. <laughs> Thank you very much.